The image is what you see when you look into the optical instrument. So in this figure, the object is this bottle. And light goes from that bottle. Is the bottle producing light? Let's start with the easy, easy question. Is the bottle producing light? No. So how is light going from the bottle then? It's reflecting light that's hitting it. So just like in this classroom, you aren't luminescent. You're not emitting light, not in the visible spectrum, but the lights in the classroom are emitting light that hits you and bounces off. And so I can see each of you because I'm seeing the light reflected from you. So the light is reflected and this picture only shows a couple rays. Of course, light is reflecting in all directions off of this object. It only shows two rays leaving the top and two rays leaving the bottom because those are the two that we're going to be interested in seeing where is the image going to be formed. So it, it only shows the interesting rays, not all of them. So you need to, when you look at one of these diagrams, don't be confused and think that's all the light coming from it. It's just the part that's going to help us. So we have light that leaves the top and notice it's showing two rays leaving the top that are separating. And then they hit the mirror and they continue to separate because the law of reflections, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection and they get to your eye. So those rays, when they get to your eye are diverging. Now your eye, which is the topic of the day is then going to take that diverging light and refocus it, bring the light back. So it comes together and meets when the light rays meet, then we have our, then, then we have a focus. And so your eye is doing that. It's making the light rays meet on the retina. And in so doing, our eye and our brain work to say, I had these rays that were coming and they're diverging by some angle. And if I extrapolate back, the rays would have all been together at one location right here. And so the brain says, based on how much they were diverging when they got to my eye, I can extrapolate back. And that's where I think the thing I'm looking at is. And so that's the image over here. This was the object. That's the image. So when you're looking, you're seeing the image. Is the object at the location where you see the image? It's not. Now, most people are very familiar with mirrors. And you know, when I look in a mirror and I see something in the mirror, it's on the same side of me as, you know, what I've seen is on the same side of the mirror as I am, because it's a mirror. But as James brought up in our lecture yesterday, you know, it's an optical illusion. If you don't know there's a mirror there, then your brain can't tell you that. And so in those magic tricks where they use mirrors, you think that what you're seeing is back there when in fact it's over there. And so the image is where you think it is, you know, where your brain would interpret it to be. And the object is where it really is. Now with this situation here, the rate at which the rays are diverging is constant. And so this here is just a mirror reflection. It's a perfect analogy or perfect verb verbiage of this here. So that means that the distance behind the mirror where the image is formed is exactly the same as the distance in front of the mirror where the object was. So for a plain mirror, we have a very simple relationship between the distance image and the distance object. Distance image equals distance object, except for one technicality. What constitutes a positive distance? An object distance for a real object, that is for a physical object, the object distance will always be positive. The object distance will be the distance from the object to the optical instrument that we're talking about, and it's always going to be positive. By convention in physics, we always put the object on the left-hand side of our item. So here are the objects on the left-hand side, so it's a positive object distance. The image distance is the distance from the optical instrument, in this case the mirror, to where the image is, 
that's positive if the image is on the same side of the optical instrument as the rays come out. Now, those words are technical. They're, they're simple words, but they're technical. If you think about this, when the light hits that mirror, the waves come out going back to your left. So the image distance would be positive if it's to your left because that's the direction that the rays come out after they hit the mirror. But the image is actually on the right. So if positive is to the left here, then what is to the right? Negative. So the technicality here is the distance image is technically minus the distance object because it's on the wrong side of the mirror. It's not on the side where the light rays exit. It's on the other side. And so the distance image is technically minus the distance object. Now, if you use any kind of geometry here, you can take things like compare this triangle and this triangle. Um, you're, you're, well, that triangle. If you compare this to this, you're going to find very quickly that the height of the image is exactly the same as the height of the object. So for a plane mirror, plane in this case does not mean normal and ordinary. That would be P-L-A-I-N. This is a P-L-A-N-E mirror, which means it's a flat mirror. For the plane mirror, the image distance is minus the distance object. The height of the image is equal to the height of the object. Those are very simple. That's, of course, something we rarely deal with in physics class because it's so simple. There are some interesting things about plane mirrors. You've probably seen an ambulance, and on the front of the ambulance, it has spelled out usually ambulance. But how is it written? It's written backward. And so the obvious question is, why is it written backward? I'm, just, I'm expecting that you do know the answer here. Why is it written backward? Because when you look at it in your rear view mirror, it will be normal reading. You don't have to be a smart enough person to read backward. Well, when you look in a mirror at the text, it's what we call inverted. Now, thinking about it a little more carefully gets you more confused because it's up in the vertical direction. How do the letters compare to normal letters? Are they upside down or are they normal size? They're normal side up for the vertical. Horizontal, what are they? They're flipped. And so you say, why did they flip it in one direction and not the other? And to answer this, the best answer I have is just think about where you see things in the mirror. If I want to see the top of my head in the mirror, what direction do I have to look? I have to look up. And so when I look up, I see the top of my head. If I want to see my right hand in the mirror, in which direction do I look? I look to my right, right? Now, if I look at you and I want to look at your right hand, which direction do I look? To my left. And so the issue here is the letters, as we look at them, you know, the ambulance, when we look in the mirror, we're going to see things as if we were looking from the other side of the letters. And so if you go, you know, here's the normal letters ambulance. If you shift over and you look at it from this side, that's the way it's spelled out. Because what's really happening is you're effectively changing the side of the letters you're looking at. Okay, the sign conventions. When is a distance positive and when is it negative? Remember, I had that technicality thing. So the object distance is positive when you have a real object. I think I said exactly those words, and I said a physical object. Real in optics means that the rays really are at that location. So a real object is an object where the rays really exist at that location. 
a virtual means that your brain would interpret or extrapolate that the rays are there, but they're not really there. That's what virtual means. So if you have a real object, it's going to be a positive object distance. And as long as you only have one lens or one mirror, it's always going to be a positive object distance. There's no other way around it. If you have two lenses, you can have a negative object distance. The image distance is once again positive if it's a real image. Based on the words I just said, what would a real image mean? Where the rays actually come together again. The image is where the rays come together. In our figure for the plane mirror, it used dashed lines to indicate those are extrapolations. So the extrapolations met, but not the actual rays. Hence, that makes this which kind of image? Makes this a virtual image. And so if you have a virtual image, you have that negative image distance. Notice there are multiple conventions for object distance and image distance. The one I like is D with the subscript of O for object, and D with the subscript of I for image. Some textbooks will use P for the object distance and Q for the image distance. So you kind of have to be flexible. Then you have the focal length. If you have a converging thing, that is if it makes the rays come together, parallel rays hit it and then they come together, then it has a positive focal length. Why? Because it forms a real parallel rays form a real image. If you have a diverging lens or mirror, if rays hit it and then they spread apart, then you have a negative focal length because you have a virtual focal point. And then finally with magnification, the magnification is positive if it's an upright image. So in this case here, the magnification, we define magnification as height of the image over height of the object. So in this case, height of the image was height of the object. It had a magnification of one. Plus one means that it's upright. If it had been minus, that would have been inverted. So those are sign conventions that we just have to be able to use. Any questions about sign conventions? Yes. Wait, so it was for the thing that you were doing before this. Right? Yeah, this. Nope. Yeah. yeah. So what about the O? Well, the object, M equals H, I over H, O. Yep. Okay. Magnification is height of the image over height of the object. And since height of the image equaled height of the object, I substitute for height of the image, height of the object there. And so it has a magnification of one. Yes, ma'am. Now, everything that we're going to do with lenses is technically going to be with thin lenses. And you might ask, why is it important that it's a thin lens? It's important that it's a thin, that is a thin lens because we're going to treat the light as changing direction only at one point. On a real lens, you have two surfaces. And so light will refract when it goes in and again when it comes out at two different locations which means that you're going to have light comes in here, changes direction, moves a little bit, so it's a different vertical height, then changes direction again. That change in vertical height makes a difference on your image. But if the lens is thin enough, we can treat it as light just comes in and changes direction all at one height. That's the thin lens approximation. And for this class, that's all we're going to focus on, thin lens approximation. All of the change in direction occurs in one location. Now we have, how do we draw a lens or mirror diagram to do our, our ray construction? For the next exam, you will need to do a ray construction like I'm teaching you in class today. You'll have to show how the rays combine to form an image. And the first thing you need to do is to draw the principal axis. So here I drew... That horizontal black line, that's the principal axis. And on that principal axis, I centered my lens. So you see the lens drawn there, centered on the principal axis. 
with the axis of my lens perpendicular to the principal axis. In practice, you know what I do? I draw my lens because we use the thin lens approximation. In practice, I draw my lens like that as just a vertical line because I'm treating it as a thin lens, so all of the change in direction occurs just on that vertical line. The point where my principal axis crosses that center line of the lens has the technical name, the vertex, or the optical center. Optical center is just another term for the vertex. So that's one of the important demarcation points to identify. Another important demar demarcation point is where the focal point is. So our lens in this case has a focal point. If I have parallel light rays come into the lens, we saw in class before break, those parallel rays, if it's a converging lens, will all meet at one location. And that place where they will meet, if it's parallel incident rays, is called the focal point. And so this capital F is indicating the focal point if parallel rays come in from the left. The distance from the center of the lens to the focal point is the focal length. So we have focal length F. I used lowercase here. The focal point F, I used a capital here. Light works the same forward and backwards. So you have the focal length F on the other side to another focal point, which is if I have an object at F prime, the light coming out of the lens will have parallel rays. So I have the symmetry of the two focal points. I've marked those. So I have the two focal points and the vertex very clearly marked here. Finally, I put my object in. My object has some height, so I put H sub O for the height of the object. It has the base of my object on, what do we call that line, the horizontal line? The principal axis. So the object has its base on the principal axis, and then it has a tip. The reason we put the base in the principal axis is so we can ignore it. We will only find the position for the image of the tip, and then we'll say the image of the base will be at the same image distance, but on the principal axis. So my image is going to, where I find the image, you know, let's say I find the tip of my object is, of my image is there. Then I'll say, well, then the base is right there on the principal axis at that same distance. That's why we put the base on the principal axis. Only one set of drawings. If you put your object like this, then you'd have to find where the image is for the bottom and where the image is for the top. Doubling your work. None of us want to. I hope none of us want to double our work. If you want to, well, then you're a strange person. So that's how we start with just drawing these problems. Now we have to learn a little bit about how the lenses and mirrors work. I already showed you in class demonstrations of light hitting a diverging lens, light hitting a converging lens, and how it had the focal points, the places where parallel rays meet. In this one here, in the converging, it was very simple. All the rays met there. In the diverging, you actually would have to extrapolate back and which one of these has a virtual focal point? The first one, this one here is a virtual focal point. So that means the focal length is negative. So the focal length is the distance from the center of the lens to where the focal point is, and it's negative for the virtual focus. It's positive for the real one. I mentioned in class before break the amount of curvature. It's like a prism, but the curvature is changing depending where you are on the lens and that's why you have all points come to a focal point, except for I mentioned one more thing. We never grind our lenses to the right shape. We grind them with spherically shaped surfaces, and that's not the right shape. Hence, it's not a perfect focus. And so you could see in the stuff I did on the board that they weren't a perfect focus. 
because it wasn't the perfect shape. Obviously, for real professional applications, such as the lenses in this projector, they actually do grind them to the proper shape because they know exactly what their parameters are. And I say to the proper shape, it's not going to be exactly the proper shape depending on the distance you have it away. If you have it at the ideal distance that it's designed for, it would be the proper shape. If you bring it a little close, it's not quite right. A little too far, it's not quite right. That's why we often go with spherical lenses because you have to have exactly the dimensions that you're using it for to get the shape right. Um, <clears throat> gonna skip over these here and get to the term paraxial ray. Paraxial means parallel to the axis parallel to the principal axis. All of our geometry is going to assume paraxial rays, rays that are pretty close to parallel to the principal axis and not very far away from the principal axis. We do that because that minimizes any of the errors in the shape of the lens. So it's not really an important distinction for anything we're doing except to know that we are taking an idealized situation. This is kind of like saying that there's no air resistance when I drop a ball. Truly, there is some air resistance. The faster it goes, the bigger the air resistance. But for our purposes, it was fine to say no air resistance gets us close to correct answers. You guys all know the words diverging and converging? Many people are nodding their heads, some aren't. So for those who aren't, diverging means separating, converging means coming together. So in this picture, this side here is diverging. This side here is converging. A lens that would make diverging light converge, we would call a converging lens because it's going to make light come together. A lens that would make parallel rays diverge is a diverging ray. Notice I changed to parallel rays because that's actually how we define it. If you have parallel rays and the lens makes it converge, it's a converging lens. If you have parallel rays and it makes it diverge, it's a diverging lens. The, the upshot of that is if it has a net convex nature, is this convex or concave? What's the left side? Convex is curving out concave is curving in is it curving out or curving in on the left side it's curving out so it's convex on this side what about on the right side on the right side it's whoops the wrong thing moved yeah that was genius of me yeah it's only when I'm teaching class that it actually is probably when I have a PDF underneath that it doesn't work. <laughs> Perfect. Close. That'll do her. So the right hand side here is flat. We call that planar. If it's convex on one side and planar on the other side, it's still going to be a converging type lens. And it has the name of, and you'll see different names, plano convex, something like that. So that's converging. This here is, is it convex or concave on the left side? Convex. What about the right side? Con no, it's convex again. It's convex on both sides because it's pushing out on both sides. So this one could be called biconvex or double convex. Different people, different names. If it has an overall convex nature, it's converging. So here are the distinction between diverging lenses and converging lenses. We have looked specifically at this one and this one. The double convex and the planal convex is named here. Then there's convex meniscus. Meniscus lenses are lenses that have curvature that's curving the same direction on both sides. How do you determine if it's convex meniscus or concave meniscus? Well, let's take 
we only have what, two students wearing the eyeglasses. No, three. I just can't see back far enough to see that Michaela's wearing them. Um, so let's just go with Ed. If you take your glasses, how can you determine if they're concave or convex? Do you have an idea? Or... Is it okay if I just know? <laughs> it's okay if you know, but I want to know how you would how you would actually determine this. Uh, if you, I mean, if you look at them, you can tell. That, like if you pull it out further, like if they're converging, that would make things bigger. If they're concave. Okay, so he's got a very practical, a practical way. My way is is more tactile and doesn't require as much knowledge as what Edward described. He described it a smart man's way. Mine is more of a dumb man's way. If you take your finger, oh, but she's got glasses on too. I think four people's glasses. If you just feel them, if they're thinner at the center and thicker at the edges, then that means that they have an overall concave nature and they're diverging. If you feel them and they're thicker at the center and thinner at the edges, then they're overall convex nature, they're converging lenses. And so most people have lenses that are thinner in the center, that are diverging. And we'll see why here in a, in a few moments, 10, 20, something like that. So let's get to how we do the next part of solving problems with lenses. We've learned about the focal point of a lens. How did I define the focal point of a lens? I'll give you a clue. I started with parallel light comes in. Where the, the parallel rays come together is where the focal point is. So that is our first rule for solving a lens problem. If I have a line that is parallel to the principal axis, we'll call that a parallel ray, it's going to refract and go through the focal point. So we're going to use that as one of our rays to determine where the image is, the parallel ray that will come parallel to our object and then refract through the focal point. The second one is just the reverse of that. Light works the same way forward and backward. So if I have a light ray that goes through the focal point and hits the ray, how's it gonna come out? By the same we mean? Parallel, it's gonna come out parallel to the principal axis. Remember, parallel in goes through the focal point. So going through the focal point is going to come out parallel. And so we call that one the focal ray. Now, two rays is technically enough to find your focal point or to find where your image is formed. But we always use a third one for redundancy to make sure we didn't make a gross mistake. So on your exam, you're going to have to use three rays. And the third one is actually the easiest of all, the vertex ray. The vertex, what was the vertex? So, place the place where the principal axis crossed the center of your lens. At that point, the two sides are parallel. If there's no thickness in their parallel, then it's just going to go straight through with no deviation. So the vertex ray is just a straight line that goes from the tip of your object through the vertex and keeps going straight. So those are the three rays that we use to find the folk, well, to find where the image is formed. Oh, yes. Which ray does not apply to a lens? Which one of these did I not name? Don't worry about getting out your clickers. I don't have it on. Just blur it out. Which one of these did I not mention? The center ray. The center ray applies to a mirror, but not to a lens. These other rays, the other three will apply to both a lens or a mirror. So I recommend just learning the other three and not worrying about the center ray because that way you can always use those three, whether it's a lens or a mirror. The center ray is a ray that goes from the center of curvature of a mirror to the mirror by definition of a sphere. It hits the mirror at an angle of instance of zero. 
our law of reflection says the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence, so it reflects straight back on itself. That's what the center ray is. But it only works for a spherical mirror. All right, here's an example of constructing the image. We have the parallel ray hits the lens. Notice I have the dashed line here at the center of the lens, and everything is treating the lens as if it's only on the dashed line. Then it bends and goes through the focal point. These focal points are not clearly marked. So there's the focal ray. Then I have the, or the parallel ray. Then the focal ray goes from the tip of my object through the focal point till it hits the lens, comes out parallel. And then finally, the vertex ray starts the tip of my object, goes through the vertex, and keeps going straight. Where those meet is where my image forms. This is labeled a real image. What evidence do you have for it being a real image besides the fact that it says real image? Okay, there would be a test. If you were to put a piece of paper there, you would actually see an image of your pencil on the paper. If it's a projected image, it's going to be real. But from the picture, how can I tell? Because the rays are truly meeting there. So it's a real image because they truly meet. Now, is this image a, an upright or an inverted image? It's an inverted real image. If you only have one mirror or one lens, these always go together. If you have two lenses or two mirrors, you can make them mix. But if it's one, it's always, if it's real, it's inverted. If it's virtual, it's upright. So what we saw up here, up, wow, we've actually gone through a lot of slides. Here was a virtual upright image. Virtual and upright go together. Real and inverted go together. So that is an example of how you construct where the image is with a ray diagram. What you're going to have to do on the test will be something with an object that might be closer than the focal length or farther than the focal length. And it could have a converging or diverging lens or a converging or diverging mirror. So that, if you take it, there are four options for the lens and mirror, and then there are two options for the position. So that's a total of eight different options that you would have. This is only one of them. Here's the second one. What's different about this? It looks very different, doesn't it? Why is it different? Okay, this is a diverging lens, a concave nature lens. And so the primary focal point is on the object side of the lens instead of the image side of the lens. And the secondary focal point is over here. So you have a negative focal length. Why does that make a difference? Your parallel rays should go through the focal point, I said. They should come out going through the focal point. But if it's diverging, they come out as if they came from the focal point on the other side. And so you see my parallel ray, ray one, it comes out as if it started at this focal, okay, using red there is probably not smart since it's the green ray. But it comes out as if it started here. So the parallel ray then I go from the focal point out to where that hit my lens and keep going for where it's extrapolated to. And then my focal ray is going straight toward the focal point on the opposite side. Because it's a diverging lens, it's going to the opposite side focal point because the focal points are flipped in position. And when it hits the lens, it comes out parallel. The rules are the same, 
you just have to keep in mind that the focal points have switched sides with the diverging lens. And then finally, the vertex ray is drawn exactly the same. The place where all three of these rays meet is by definition where the image forms. So I look at where these meet, these rays, the parallel ray, the vertex ray, and the focal ray, those rays are never going to meet, which means it never forms a real image. But if your eyeball is looking at this, your eyeball is simply going to extrapolate back and say, okay, i got to go like this side. I was, your eyeball is going to say, okay, these rays are going like this. They must have converged back here. And so your brain says there's an image here. Did the rays really converge here? No. Hence, it has a name virtual image because the rays didn't really converge there. So this has a virtual image and is it upright or inverted? Upright. Remember once again, upright goes with virtual as long as you have one mirror or one lens. So that's a second option on how to draw these. Before I go to any other options, let's talk some geometry. Here is showing only two rays. One, what do you call the upper ray here in this figure? The parallel ray. And what do you call the lower one? The vertex ray. So we have here just the parallel and vertex rays. And based on these two diagrams, we can do some geometry. And so what kind of geometry am I going to do? Well, I'm going to start with just this triangle right here. And this triangle right here. Because those are the same lines just crossing each other, we by definition have the same angle on both sides of where they cross. And each of those has a right angle here. And so I can instantly use similar triangles to say the ratio of sides has to be the same. So I take the ratio of this side to this side is equal to the ratio of this side to this side. You guys remember in geometry class where that's how we indicate sides with sides with one hint. Yeah. And so that gives me the ratio that says H prime over H is equal to, notice this one here is using Q, which is the same as distance image, over P, which is the same as distance object. And so when I put in the equation, I changed it from Q and P to distance object and distance image. So I now have a relationship between the magnification, the magnification is H prime over H is equal to the distance image over the distance object. So that's a first important thing. We can find the magnification either with the height ratio or the distance ratio, except for one thing. A little technicality, and what's that technicality? The sign. The H prime was actually inverted here. And so I actually need to introduce a minus sign. And so the magnification is equal to H prime over H or minus the distance image over the distance object. So you don't actually have to measure the height of the object and height of the image to get the magnification. It's just going to be the ratio of the distance image to distance object with that minus sign thrown in. And there you see the equation. Yay. Next. Now this is a little more involved. I'm not going to go through the math. It's not hard, but we have better things to do like lab today. But this here is taking the triangles 
here and here. And once again, using similar triangles. And when you take those and simplify, you actually can find without a significant amount of work using the relationship that we found up above here between H prime and distance image that, okay, let's keep going. <laughs> I don't have it worked out here. I guess I just planned on doing the work. Trust me, you can do this work. You find that one over the focal length is equal to one over distance image plus one over distance object. We call this the thin lens equation. And it has an alternate name, the mirror equation. Because the same equation works whether it is a mirror or a lens, because the geometry is the same whether it's a mirror or a lens. So if you know the focal length and the distance image, you can instantly calculate the distance object. Or if you know the distance image and the distance object, you can instantly calculate the focal length. One other thing I'm going to throw in right now, because I'm not sure where I have it in my lecture, I want to make sure I cover it. What are the units for focal length? What do we measure when we measure focal length? It's a distance. And so what units should we have for distance? Meters. So focal length has units of meters. One over focal length then has units of, let's go with the redundant answer. What would one over focal length have units of? One over meters, which has a new name, diopters. And you might wonder, why? Why do we have a new name for one over focal length units? It's because that's how we measure the power of a lens. The lens power is one over the focal length in units of diopters. So for instance, let us suppose that your eyeglasses have a prescription of minus 2.5. Does anybody here know what their eyeglass prescription is? No? You, you do, Michaela? Yeah. What, what, will, you, will you share with us? Negative 1, negative 0.75. So we can take that and we can say I might have left and right crossed over. But we have those for the powers. That means the focal length for the left is equal to is minus one meter, right? We can get the focal length instantly from that. And the focal length for the left or for the right I put the minus sign in the wrong place, but so 0.75 is three quarters, invert three quarters is four thirds. And so we can instantly calculate what the focal lengths are for her lenses. And we can also deduce that she has very good vision, better than mine. I don't know why you're wearing glasses. I'd never wear mine. <laughs> So when you see those powers in your glasses, now you can, you, you know what it's telling you. And by the end of today, you should be able to do your own prescription, although I wouldn't trust your own prescription. All right. Um, let's do this in groups of tables. Alex, you'll have to join one of the front tables that has more than one person. Let's have each table 
do this problem. Excuse me? What was your question? Um, it tells you it's a 25 centimeter focal length. That's a plus 25. Uh, I'm going to have each group finish and then I'm going to draw a card and have that person come up and explain part A and then draw another card and have person explain part B and so calculation just put your drawer back in that way I'll know which tables are done and I won't you know wait too long if you have questions you can ask
Well, this, this equation is exactly correct. So you have minus whatever you just did. So if you just did just minus 0.79, you have minus and minus. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, we have a right now. Did this one? Because I was trying to find the big and she's like, I have this one soft. I just look at my new one. Oh, yeah, I didn't even realize it was Yeah, that one is, I don't know what I think. I was like, what is this? We were trying to, like, find the Is there any part of physics that has less than math? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's mostly just like bronze lines. Yeah. 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 Ye
it's fun when you're using math for something that you just So unlike today, you can go out and find the Well, wait. Oh, yeah. Well, that was fine. I guess. Watching other people. Watching other we do to be
Oh, that's right. <laughs> 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 I suppose I can try to do it in my head, but no, I would fail doing it in my head. You trust me? I got you. I think so. I got you. Do the best thing. Do the Even though I'm curious of what we're doing, <laughs> stop that. I'll take well, that. Thank you. <laughs> like, I'm exactly like, I'm like, I'm like, no, like, I didn't really understand. They didn't give me examples or anything. I was like, I also don't want to give you examples. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. That's important. Okay. Yes, that's exactly right. It's, this is the best situation. I mean, I do go crash it no, you can say it's so I mean, it's still like the tires are brand new. So, so there's lots of pieces that we can talk about. But the car itself is brand new. So you can just have a good car. Not much of a car, but how does that come up? Yeah, this one was. And he was he was he Yeah. 
Okay, there are two groups that are still finishing up, but I will, since we've been working on this quite a while, I will move forward. And I was going to ask people to, to, you know, explain their work, but I think that we have enough incorrect answers out there. I don't want people to be embarrassed. So, so let's start. There are two simple approaches that I've outlined in today's lecture. Either one could be used to do this. One would require very careful measuring and one doesn't. So most of us would go with the one that doesn't. But what are the two methods? Drawing a diagram or, or calculating using the thin lens equation. So I'm going to start with the thin lens equation. How many people started with the thin lens equation? One, two, three, four, four and a half-ish at the very least. So the thin lens equation, one over F equals one over distance object plus one over distance image. Now, right off the bat, Edward asked, you know, is that a converging or diverging lens? And I said, it says we have a focal length of 25 centimeters, that means plus 25 centimeters. What did that mean, Michaela, that it was a plus 25 centimeter lens? That it's a converging lens. So we know that it's a converging lens because F is a positive value. Now, I don't even have to be wise enough to do that manipulation in my brain to actually solve this problem. But it's really good that you have that knowledge and, and can make that connection, especially if you're going to be doing the diagram. So I wanted to find a bunch of things. Is the image real or virtual? Is it upright or inverted? Where is it located? All three of these are answered with one calculation. What is distance image? Okay. Let's say distance image is positive. If the distance image is positive, what does that tell you about the image? That would be a negative. If you, but I thought they were given the object's distance as positive as well. So it would be on the same. The, the object's distance is positive. But remember, the object distance is positive if it's on the side the light starts from. The image distance is positive if it's on the side the light ends going to. So for a lens, positives are opposite sides for the object and distance and image. Right, those sign conventions are really important. If you don't have sign convention down, it's going to mess everything up. So if the distance image is positive, we knew that magnification is equal to height of image over height of object is equal to minus distance image over distance object. Since the distance object is positive, if the distance image is positive, what does that make the image? Is it upright or inverted? If distance image is positive, you have minus a positive number over a positive number, which means your magnification is negative. Negative magnification means inverted. So if the distance image is positive, then it's inverted. And then I said it always goes that if you have an inverted image, it's going to be real. Also, if it's a positive image distance, it's real. It's a rule. So if the distance image is positive, it's going to be inverted and real. Conversely, if distance image is negative, then it's going to be upright and virtual. So if I find that image distance, not only will I know where it's located, I'll know if it's real or virtual and if it's upright or inverted. So now I just do my calculation.
One over distance image is one over the focal length minus one over the distance object. Focal length here is 25 centimeters, so one over 25 centimeters minus one over my distance object is 19 centimeters. And so I have to put that in the old calculator. Put that in the calculator. One divided by 25 is what, 0.04? Nope. <laughs> Can't do my math. Yeah, 0.04 minus 1 divided by 19. So 1 over distance image is minus 0 0.01263 in units of 1 over centimeter. So how do I get the distance image from this? I simply have to invert it. And so I get my distance image is, and anybody want to blurt out the right answer? Minus 79, and what is that, one? So it's minus 79.16 repeating. Of course, how many significant digits do we have here? Two. So that's really just minus 79 centimeters. What does it mean that my distance image is minus 79 centimeters? Virtual, upright, on the same side as the object. How many people had virtual, upright, on the same side as the object? Okay, we had roughly half the class with that answer. Then I have how tall is the image? Well, how do I find how tall it is? I'll just come back to this. Height of the image over height of the object is equal to minus 79 centimeters is my distance image over 19 centimeters was my object distance. The height of the object was 3 centimeters, so I'll put it there. Got to put my sign there. And so I have, yes. So there's the height. That was the distance image. That's how you do it algebraically. Now, I want to show you how to do it with the picture as well because it's important you, this is one of the other variations that could be on the test. Yes? Mm -hmm. No, not from the focal point. From the lens. Right, it's from, this is describing the lens there. Actually, I should have put it like this. 25 centimeter focal length, that's describing the lens. So from a lens. Okay, so with the diagram, what's the first thing I should draw for my diagram? Okay, I should not try to use it. Yes, I should first start with the principal axis. There's my principal axis. I'm doing this freehand because you saw the ruler tool not working again for me. It's got to do with the PDF, I'm sure. So I have the principal axis. Then I'm going to draw my lens. There's my lens. You may ask, is that converging or diverging? It's just a line because I'm doing a thin lens. It's converging because we have a positive focal length. I need to put my two focal points. Each one is 
what was it, 29? Um, yeah, 25. I can't find where I'm drawing. And then I need to place my object. My object is here, 19 centimeters. Now we have three rays to draw. I'm going to erase the 25 centimeters here because it's interfering with me. What are the names of the three rays? Parallel ray is the first one. Parallel ray starts parallel, and then how does it refract? Refract so it goes through the focal point. Best I can do freehand. Okay, next ray. Vertex ray. Vertex ray goes through the vertex. Final ray. Focal ray. Now this one's going to be tricky. The focal ray is supposed to go from the tip of my object through the focal point on the same side. Unless it's a diverging lens, which is going to flip it to the opposite side. Well, that ray would go like this. That's never going to hit my lens, is it? So I just say, well, let's take that lens and extrap or that ray and extrapolate it to our lens. And then how's the focal ray come out? If it goes from the focal point through the tip and hits the lens, how's it going to come out? That's right, Lauren, parallel. Now you look at these rays and you say, where do these rays meet? The answer is never. So that means it's not going to form a real image. And so then I have to go the other direction. I extrapolate back. And you can see that I didn't do a very good job on the green one specifically. The other two are fine. And so now you have crossings, one crossing here, one crossing here, and one crossing back here. That's the reality of bad drawing. That's why when you do these on the test, you're going to need to have a ruler to use an actual scale. You'll have to measure your distances and use straight lines. One thing that you don't have to do is have the same vertical scale as horizontal scale, right? Because I have a distance of 19 centimeters for the object distance and three centimeters for the height. If I use the same scale, I really would have a tiny height. So your vertical scale and horizontal scale can be different, but you need to be consistent on your horizontal scale and consistent on your vertical scale. So in this case, this is what I always do in the case of sloppy writing. I say, let's just take the average of the three, the center one, and say, there's my image. And so then I measure this distance for the distance image. The image is on the wrong side. It's an, a virtual image because they didn't actually reach that point. And because it's a virtual image, it's a negative image distance. And so I measure that distance. And if I had drawn an accurate diagram, I would be at minus 79 centimeters. Any questions? Yes, Erica. So the measurement, what is it after the focal point was 25 centimeters? And the image was 19 centimeters. The object was 19 centimeters. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, like, then the focal point would be near the object, wouldn't it? Um, the object and focal point are relatively close, yes. They're four or six centimeters apart. Which, I mean, it, if I were to be more careful, I would have had my object more like this, maybe. Right, but I wasn't measuring anything, so I couldn't have it the right place. Okay. Was measuring because my ruler wasn't working. Uh -huh. So, what are the the 25 centimeters is the distance from the lens to each f and f prime right i have f prime and f drawn here yeah 
Any other questions here? Yes, Ashley. Okay, I didn't get it from the picture because my picture is not an accurate picture. I got the 79 from the actual algebra, which is there. Um, be, well, number one, because you're going to have to on the exam. And number two, because it's an alternate way of doing it. But the key here is I did not have a ruler that I could use to make accurate lines of the right length and straight. And that's why my picture has gross error because I did not have a ruler to do it. When you're doing the image, unless you only want a qualitative answer, you need to actually have it measured carefully. Other questions? All right. Unfortunately, when I tried to go to this website, which of course the link doesn't work with this, when I tried to go to this website last, well, the week before break, it wasn't working for me. And that's very disappointing because this applet, the optics workbench makes it really easy to see how the rays are gonna work for different problems. So I will continue to look for some place that has this still working. It might just be that, you know, using Chrome browser, it doesn't work. You know, try using a different browser, maybe it'll work. But I'll try to let you know, it's very useful to be able to actually see how the rays are working for various problems. And, you know, you can, with this applet, you can change the object distance, the focal length, and, you know, solve all your problems, which is nice. You can put multiple lenses, make a telescope, whatever. Okay, I've been working with lenses, mirrors, also focus light. So everything we've done with mirrors works the same with lenses except for one thing. The lens reverses the direction of the light. So the light comes in and reflects off, or excuse me, I said lens instead of mirror. The mirror reverses the direction. So light comes in and reflects back the opposite direction, which means that you only have one focal point to mark with a mirror because of the light coming back on the same side. Both focal points are on the same side. If it's a converging mirror, that is a concave mirror, then it's going to have the focal point is on the same side as the object. The side the light is on, you'll have a real focal point. If it's a diverging, a convex mirror, then the focal point is a virtual focal point, a negative focal length. The focal length was actually shown in a diagram above. It's just based on the shape of the mirror because angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. It turns out that the focal length is always one divided by the radius of curvature for a mirror. So if you know the radius of a mirror, you immediately know its focal length. And yeah, that's all I'm going to do on that. Let's go to today's lab. Now, how many people heard me talking to Erica and Amanda? Nobody? Tell them what I told you, Erica. Because we took a lot longer on that problem that I had anticipated taking, I'm not going to have you do an actual lab project today because, yeah, we would probably end up being here. There would be time if you started now, but I haven't gone over the eye yet. So I'm going to talk about the eye and the vision problems, and then we'll go home. So That's right. So you won't have a lab report. You'll have nothing to upload. You don't have to, to worry you do have to stay, though, Corso. <laughs> Corso, thank man. I got you. I'm out of here. <laughs> okay. So the human eyeball. The human eyeball is a pretty complex optical instrument. And I am going to, to go back a little bit to a... What I think is a related topic to any class at Union College. And that is, I believe that we have a creator God who created us pretty miraculously. And the eye to me is an example of the amazing creation. 
So the eye, when you look at the eye, you have a lot of pieces there that do different jobs. So the first piece is that little layer of, well, the membrane that covers the cornea. I, I think I learned at some point it's called the sclera, but I hate to be wrong, so I'm just going to call it that layer. It has air on one side, and on the other side, it's essentially water. And so it has index refraction that's very close to water. Well, what happens when light goes from air to water? It bends, it refracts. And that cornea gives us a shape there that's pretty close to spherical. And so that's forming a lens that is sticking out. Is that a converging or diverging type lens? Converging. So the front surface of our eyeball is essentially a converging lens. So if you have parallel light rays that come into the eyeball, they're going to go like this. <laughs> and if my picture here was accurate, it'd be all fuzzy because those rays don't meet on the retina. Now, there's a lot more going on here than just that front surface. That front surface is the primary focusing element of your eyeball. That's what determines your focusing for the most part. So my grandfather, God bless his soul, he played goalie in hockey and catcher in baseball. And in both, he apparently made some mistakes because he, uh, he decided to catch one batter without wearing his mask. And the batter tipped it and it hit him in the eye. Playing hockey, he took a hockey puck to the eye. The same one. And that damage damaged his cornea changed the shape of it and made it so it was opaque. What happens then is you don't see with that eye, right? And so that eye for the rest of his life just did crazy things, I'm told. He, I was too and living after he died, so I didn't know it. But it just did its own thing. And later on in his life, when they developed artificial corneas, you know, doctor said, well, you know, we can replace that cornea and you can see just fine. But at that point, the eye did this action. What's the point of making it see just fine if it's just wandering around? So that cornea is a primary focusing element. After the cornea, then you have the iris. What's the iris? It's what? Okay, the iris is what gives the eye color. If you look at my eyes, you'll see they're brown. That's because the iris is absorbing certain colors. It's a genetic thing. Dad's got blue eyes. I got the German eyes. All of my siblings, we have blue eyes until we're like six or seven. Then they turn brown. So that's the iris. But the iris has a very important function. The iris makes a hole that can get bigger or smaller. When that hole is big, it allows a lot of light in. If the hole is smaller, you have less light that comes in. So that's the purpose of the iris. Now I'm going to go back to some other things. I remember I said this is pretty amazing that God created all this, in my opinion. The iris is controlled by the brain. It's kind of like you have a video camera, and the video camera senses how much light there is and adjusts the brightness. It adjusts the sensitivity by changing that aperture. Your phone does the same thing, right? If you have your camera on and you change it over here and there's something bright, initially it flashes bright and then it gets darker. Our brain is doing the same thing with that iris that's controlling the light. Well, what happens if you suffer a brain injury? How many people here are EMTs? Okay, we got that four, five, six. Did you raise your hand a minute? No, okay, so five. I saw five hands for EMTs. One of the first things we do with trauma victims, okay, well, first thing, seems safety, right? And, and then you do your ABCs. They have an airway, the breathing, they getting circulation. All right, you got all that covered. You get them on the gurney, get them in the bus, you drive them down the road, and you take your little pin light, 
and you shine it in their eye. Why do you do that with your trauma patients? Yeah, you're checking to see if their brain's still working right. Because if their brain's still working right, when you shine the light, right, you've got the lights off in the button ambulance. You've got the lights off, and you shine that light on there, they go from dark to bright, and the iris should close down. If it doesn't close down, if it's what we call blown, it's just big, it doesn't matter how much light you put in, that tells you, uh-oh, the brain ain't communicating right. Right, because it's supposed to be automatic. There are other times when I've had to use this test. For some reason, I can never tell when one of my patients is drunk. So I had this lady that crashes her car. As far as I can tell, she's fine as can be. But when I shine the light in her eye, instead of her iris going like this, it goes, what's up with that? Yeah. She was drunk and her brain wasn't working right again. Right, it's just, just, you know, you lose coordination, yeah, and you also lose that coordination with the brain telling the iris to control. So that's one of the tests to tell if somebody is mentally altered by drugs or by, you know, physical trauma. Then we go to the, uh, the, cor the, uh, the lens. The lens are sometimes called the crystalline lens. There is something in front of the crystalline lens and behind the crystalline lens. There's the aqueous humor and the aqueous, oh boy, what's the other name? Such a B or something. Or vit the vitreous humor. Yeah, aqueous humor and vitreous humor. Those are essentially water. Not exactly, but their index refraction is like 1.336. Water's like 1.334. You know, they're, very, they're essentially water. And then you have that crystalline lens, which has index refraction that's just a little different, not a lot different. That crystalline lens, though, has a really unique function. There are muscles on it that can make it change shape. And so that's an adjustable focal length lens. We use that adjustable focal length lens for what we call accommodation. That's the thing that allows you to focus on at different distances. The, the shape of the cornea sets your long distance focus. I cannot focus clearly on that periodic table of elements. That means that my cornea is misshapen. I have a crystalline lens in here that can adjust and can make it so I can focus fine on some things. So I can see fine here, I can see fine here, I can see fine here. But if I get out beyond about arm's length, then things start to get fuzzy because I only have so much adjustment with that crystal lens. Not very much. So which lens is the primary focusing elements of the eye? The, the cornea. What was the purpose then of the crystal lens, the one that's normally called the lens? Is to adjust your focus so you can see a different lens. Because the cornea would allow you to focus on things very far away. And for practical purposes, if it's two meters away, guys, if it's Amanda, she might as well be infinitely far away from me. If I can focus on Amanda, I can focus on something infinitely far away. There's not that much difference. But for focusing from Amanda in, the adjustment should be done with the crystalline lens. Then we go through that, yes, calls it vitreous gel there instead of vitreous humor. And you get to the retina. The retina is the image detection. Now, this is a pretty amazing instrument. We've already got a front surface mirror or lens, lens, front surface lens, and then an adjustable lens. In between those, we have the iris so we can adjust the light. It's a, an optical system very similar to what we have in cameras today. You know, if you have a reflex lens system, I think it has a total of three lenses. This is only two lenses, but it's doing the same thing, allowing you to adjust the focus. And then you form the image on the retina. The retina here is curved. That's actually better optically than having it flat. Because you will have the focal point shifts a little bit when you go off axis, and the curve accommodates for that. 
So we have this system then that's going to measure, find images, and, and, and record it. How do we record it? On the retina, we have two fundamentally different types of light sensors. We have things that are cylindrical in shape that are called rods. And those rods, they have a very broad sensitivity over the visible spectrum. We don't detect color with the rods. We only detect light and no light. But they're very sensitive. Then there's things that are shaped conically. So we call them cones. And we have three types of cones. I say we. Most people have three types of cones. One type of cone that is most sensitive in the blue. One type that's most sensitive in well, we say in the red, one that's most sensitive in the green. The actual peaks aren't exactly red, green, and blue, but they're roughly different. Because of those three different types of cones, we can see three colors. How many colors can we see? Three. But each cone can measure about 100 different levels. Now, if you think of that, about that, you know, with your television, you have a lot more than 100 different levels of brightness. But each cone can only measure about 100 different levels of brightness for that cone. But since we have three different kinds of cones, the red cones, the green cones, and the blue cones, you put that together and the amount of colors you can make is 100 times 100 times 100, or about a million colors that we can see because of the different amounts of activation of each kind of cone. Now, back to the cones. Red, green, and blue. Those are the three primary colors of light because those are the three types of cones we have. In art, you might have learned other primary colors. I never can remember what they teach you in art because I'm a physicist and we stick with the biology and physics. But light, that, that's what we're seeing. How much red was activated, how much green was activated, how much blue was activated. In art, they use pigments, they're absorbing instead of looking at light, they're absorbing light. And so in art, you have pigments that should absorb. And if you are absorbing one color, you want to absorb either red or green or blue, and then reflect the other two. And if you absorb red, that means you're reflecting green and blue. Well, if you mix green and blue light together, you know what you get? If you mix. Um, yeah, it's, it's yellow. If you mix green and blue, you get yellow. So yellow is a primary pigment because that's what you get if you absorb blue and reflect the red and green. And then you, if you absorb red, you're going to reflect blue and yellow. What color is that? No, no. If you reflect blue and yellow, we call that cyan. So cyan is another primary pigment. And then the final one, if you absorb green, you reflect red and blue. If you put the red and blue light together, you have magenta. And so those are the primary pigments. Cyan, yellow, and magenta. Why? Because each one is reflecting two of the primary colors and absorbing the third. So if you buy a printer for your ink, you buy CYMK. C for cyan, Y for yellow, M for magenta, because your printer is using a pigment. All this is because our eye has those three kinds of cones. But I said, most of us. If you don't want to and you are, just feel free to not volunteer. Anyone here have a colorblindness issue? Okay. No, no one raised their hand, which is fine. The odds are usually that I'll have one guy in the class that has colorblindness. It's extremely unlikely that it would be a female that has colorblindness um, because it's a, a sex linked trait. But the most common kinds of colorblindness are red, green colorblindness. Because those cones, the red one and the green one are very similar. 
In fact, evolutionary scientists believe that probably at some point we had two types of cones, the blue cone and a red-green cone, and then a mutation occurred that made the red-green cone, cone, slight, cone slightly different, and so people had two different similar cones, and that allows you to see more color, and so that would be an advantage. You could tell the difference between a red fruit and a green fruit, and thus you're less likely to poison yourself, or something like that. As a creationist, I believe God created us with these three cones already. Now, God couldn't have created us with two of the mutations, could have occurred to give us three. It wouldn't make a difference to my faith. But you have those three cones. But if you have a colorblindness issue, it's probably a dude, you probably have too little of the red or too little of the green, and so you can't really differentiate those colors. But then there's another thing that's not considered a problem at all. There are some people who are tetrachromats. What would tetra mean? Four. There's some people that apparently have four different kinds of color cones. So their color gamut, my color gamut is a million colors, right? 100 times 100 times 100. What's the color gamut for somebody that's a tetrachromat? That'd be times another 100. So they see 100 million colors. Let's think about that for a second. When they see colors, they're seeing 100 times the shadings that we see. How do you know if you're a tetrachromat? <laughs> people have tried to make tests to try to, to test it. There are some people who swear, I see colors other people don't see. Yeah, I look at this, they say, yeah, that's white, that's white. And I say, no, they're not even close to the same shit. Scientists have done research. Unfortunately, the only real way to tell is to dissect the eyeball, and nobody wants that. <laughs> uh, but after, you know, they, they've done testing on people who are living that they believe are tetrachromats, and then after they die, they will dissect the eyeballs to determine, were they really a tetrachromat? Was all of my research valid, or did I just waste 30 years of research? Good times, right? But there, there are people who can see more colors than the standard person, 100 times as many colors, which is pretty awesome. And of course, just like colorblindness comes in men, tetrachromats come in women. Yeah. God didn't give us all the advantages. He gave us a few and took away a few. <laughs> so this is a pretty miraculous eyeball. Some people have argued what kind of a, of a wise creator would create the eyeball with on the retina you have the cones. I think they're actually aimed like that. The light has to come and go past the cone and it detects it at the back side. Like, what kind of sense does that make? Seems like a pretty good argument, doesn't it? Wouldn't it make more sense to have the light-sensitive part facing where the light's coming in? Well, in essence, yes. What they have found is that the cones will actually respond if you have really bright light. When it hits the backside, they will actually respond and deaden themselves so that you don't perceive it as bright in just that instant that it takes when it lights the backside to the front side. So there actually is a benefit to having the back, backward like that. So it, it's really amazing. Another thing that the evolutionists will say, well, what kind of a smart God would do that, is you have this region right here where the optic nerve attaches to the retina. You can't see anything there. The eye is blind in that spot. You have a blind spot. And they're like, why would you have the blind spot there? I don't have any reasonable answer to why you would. So I bring out a question I don't have an answer for. But I still believe that this eye is a pretty miraculous thing. And evolutionarily speaking, <laughs> by the way, you all who are in that class, that origins class, I'm your teacher for the next month. You know that, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, where was I going with this? <laughs> evolution of the eyeball. Uh, well, yes, evolution of the eyeball. So, how many people know anything about the fossil record and geology? Yeah. Oh, come on. You guys have a... You will. Yeah, okay. 
Well, the fossil record, basically, if you look through different layers of the Earth's sediment, we have an understanding of superposition. That is, when new sediment forms, it forms on top of the old sediment. That kind of makes sense, right? It's not going to form underneath, it forms on top. And so that means that if you look at the bottom of the layers of sediment, that should be older. You look at the top, it should be younger. And so if you look at the sediment layers around the Earth, you find that down at the bottom, you have you know, very, very basic things. And then about 520, 521 million years ago, you have the so-called Cambrian explosion. And this explosion is an explosion of life. You have life forms of a huge variety suddenly appearing. And evolutionary theory says that if you have the same features in two different animals, there's a good chance that they diverge from something that had already developed the basis for that feature. Well, at that Cambrian explosion where you go from very basic things to this broad wealth of different species, you have eyeballs existing in many of these different species, which, and that, that means that the eyeball had to have been already pretty much developed at the time of the Cambrian explosion. We have these very basic things, which doesn't make much sense. How can you have something this complicated have been developed that early in the process? So to me, that's another thing that points to a creation. The fact that at the Cambrian explosion, we have a very similar eyeball across virtually all species. I say virtually all, clearly not all species have eyeballs that are exactly the same. You've seen differences in, you know, like cats have reflective eyeballs. Ours aren't that reflective. Except for when you take a photograph, you can see the, what do you see in somebody's eyeball if it's uh, in a photograph just right? You see it red. What are you seeing there? You're seeing light reflecting off of the retina that's apparently absorbing and looking like blood. It's kind of, kind of crazy. Okay, we've talked about this eye here enough. Let's talk about what the purpose of today's lab was. I'm not going to talk about the fret refresh rate and stuff, even though it's really cool. Common vision problems. Myopia. Myopia has a common name nearsighted. A myopic person has great vision for near objects. Nearsighted is very explanatory. They can see near things just fine. I've already explained that I can see my hand here just fine, but I can't see the periodic table well at all. I mean, I can see it. I just can't make out the numbers unless I squint. And then I can only see the numbers in blue. So I have myopia. I'm nearsighted. What does that mean? That means that my eyeball is misshapen in some way. How, you ask, is Richard's eyeball misshapen? You were at, you're going to ask that, I'm sure. So let's go to the demonstrations. Here I have my nice laser lights, and I have an eyeball model. I have parallel light coming in. If my eyeball is going to see well, I want those parallel rays to all come together at one point. And where should that point be? At the retina, I heard somebody say. So if I put this lens in, there, look. The light all came to focus on the retina, I've got perfect vision. That's the way it's supposed to be. But what if I don't have perfect vision? Let's put in this here. Wah, wah. There are two ways to describe my problem. Way number one is to say that my eyeball is too long because the light's coming to a focus before it gets to the retina. The other way to say it is that my lens is too converging, which means that the cornea has too much curvature on it, it needs to be flattened out. Either one of those is an apt description. But when it push comes to shove, what do I need to do to correct my vision problem here? Shorten the eyeball. Okay, shorten the eyeball. We never shorten the eyeball. 
So let's go for another option. Okay, I need to increase the focal length. So back in the dark ages when I was in graduate school, they had surgery to increase the focal length. And I call it the dark ages because it really is Neanderthal. They would cut that flap of, let's call it skin, flare, I think is the right term, and flip it back so that they have access to the cornea. And then they would take a scalpel and they would very carefully make incisions on the cornea. And then they put the flap back on to send them home. What, what good is it to do make incisions on the cornea? What, what happens to you if you make incisions on your arm? You form scars. Well, that's what's going to happen to the cornea, too. It forms scar tissue. And if they calculate it just right, and if you form the right amount of scar tissue, maybe they would have a resurface that's the right shape. Exactly. I'm like, why would you want to do that? But that's what they used to do. So that was radial keratotomy or something like that. Well, now they've gotten much more specialized. I did not do research in this area. I did research with the kind of lasers they did studying how you can vaporize transparent materials. But what they do now is they carefully measure the shape of the cornea, they carefully measure what the shape needs to be, and then they use a laser to they take that flap back again, and then they use pulses of laser to vaporize parts of the cornea to reshape it. And with the laser reshaping, you have minimal scar tissue form. They put the flap back on. You go home, and your, your vision is instantly better. And they can get you much more accurately better vision with that process. So the photo, radial keratotomy, is a much better um, process, much less barbaric. But go ahead, Amanda. Oh, I have a question, too. Why is squinting that help? Why does squinting help? I will answer that, but let me go through all of this first. But squinting definitely helps, it's, you know. So short of playing with the eyeball and changing the cornea, we can also put something in front to cause the light to diverge so that it forms the image back here. So I have two lenses here. I have a concave nature and a convex nature lens. Which one will make the light diverge? Concave. So I can put the concave one in front. Voila! Vision is corrected. That's what you're doing when you're wearing your eyeglasses if you are nearsighted. Now for the calculation of this, well, I'll talk about the calculation after I finish the demonstrations. So that's nearsighted. That's myopic. Now we have somebody who's hyperopic. Somebody who is farsighted. Somebody who is farsighted can see far things just fine, but close things are out of focus. And what's happening there is just the opposite. You have the cornea is too flat or the eyeball is too um, short. And no, Alex, we don't have surgery to lengthen the eyeball either. <laughs> so instead, we put a lens that's now going to converge the light in front. And voila, we fixed it. Those are our two really common vision things that we fix with eyeglasses. Now, they're not the only ones we fix with eyeglasses. There's a couple more listed here. So let's look at those. Um, do remember, in case I don't come back to it, Amanda, to ask me again. <clears throat> so myopia we fix by putting with eyeglasses a diverging nature lens. Hyperopia we fix with a converging nature lens. Presbyopia. You probably don't know. Presby means old. Presbyopia is old person vision. How many people know somebody who when they got old, suddenly they had a hard time reading? Okay, we have a couple people that raised their hands. That's presbyopia. What's going on with presbyopia is that the, the crystalline lens here, 
this lens gets hard as you get older sometimes. That's the point it's supposed to adjust. If it gets hard and it won't adjust, you can't accommodate anymore. You can't adjust your focus to see closer things. So people with presbyopia, with old person vision, their far vision is going to stay the same as it always was. But their near vision goes out on them. Now, can you have presbyopia and myopia? Yeah. Yes, because myopia is a problem with the geometry of the eye. Presbyopia is a problem with the crystalline lens. They can both have problems. But then you're kind of in the weird situation because a myopic person is nearsighted. They can only see near and they can't see far. A presbyopic person is effectively farsighted. They can see far, but they can't see near. You put those together and what can you see? Nothing. Yeah, nothing. Or maybe there's this range right here where I can see. Well, that's kind of a problem. So how do we fix this? Well, to fix, a lot of people confuse presbyopia with farsightedness because both of them you can see far in theory. For farsightedness, you use a lens that's converging. But for nearsightedness, you use a diverging lens. So Ben Franklin came up with the idea of let's make glasses that have both. Let's make glasses that are bifocals. This is the second time, by the way, that Ben Franklin's come up this semester, right? A lot of people don't think of him as much of a physicist because he was you know, a famous statesman. But he came up with some good things. He came up with the bifocals so that you look through one part and it allows you to see far. And you look through the other part and it allows you to see near. And of course, the bifocal has been improved on. There was a time when people would get trifocals. So you would have, you know, for near, for middle, for far. And now you simply can get a progressive lens. The progressive lenses have continuously changing focal lengths. So you can just adjust your head for any distance. It's pretty ingenious. So these three that you see right here, myopia, hyperopia, presbyopia, those are all fixed with pretty simple lenses. The last one of the lens corrections is possibly the most complicated. Astigmatism. Astigmatism means that your eyeball is not symmetric. You have the cornea has a different curvature this way as compared to this way, which means that you can have vertical light focused at this distance, but horizontal light's focused at this distance, which means you never have a great focus. The test for that is you have a bunch of, e okay, using the highlighter is not going to work for that, a bunch of equally weighted lines like this. And then the tricky eye doctor says, which one of these lines is the darkest or the thickest? And you look, and if you say, oh, this one here definitely looks thicker than the others, then he says, aha, uh -huh, or she says, aha. Uh -huh. You have an astigmatism, and that's one of the two axes of the astigmatism. And then they work more carefully to determine what the focal length is for that direction versus that direction. And then they give you eyeglasses that are ground with different curvatures in those two directions to make them so it comes to focus the same in both directions. So you have a cylindrical component to your lens. Cylindrical component means only changing, you know, it's different curvature this way than it is this way. To correct for astigmatism. <sighs> Just a few more things before I can answer your question. How many people are wearing contact lenses? Okay, we have a lot of people wearing contact lenses. I used to date a girl who wore both contact lenses and eyeglasses. That's, that's bad vision. Um, no, I, because she needed them both. Yeah. The worst part of that one, she went to a party. I didn't go because, you know, good, good little saint. 
She came home and she had lost contact lens and she didn't know that it wasn't there. She couldn't recognize me from two paces without her contact lenses and she didn't know that she was missing the contact lens. Alcohol messes you up. Anyway, so what's the difference in an eyeglass and a contact lens? The only difference is where you place the lens. So let's look at the correction for farsightedness, nearsightedness, and compare using contact lenses to eyeglasses. So first of all, I will start with a nearsighted person. A nearsighted person, what is their problem? Cannot see far. So the correction is going to be make an object at the ideal far point. Far point from now on, I'm going to abbreviate is FP. Make an image at actual far point. Okay, so I defined far point. Nope, I just said it. Well, what is the far point? The far point is the farthest distance away from your eyeball where you can focus clearly. So now this is not a scientifically valid measurement of the far point. But to a good approximation, I can take this meter stick, I can take my finger, and I can focus on it. And I can come up here and take my near point is the closest where I can focus, so my near point is somewhere around there. So let's look at that. My near point is about 17 centimeters. Then I keep going out, and my far point is the farthest point where it's in focus, which is somewhere <laughs> out. For, for me, it's about a meter away. So you can measure your near point and far point. Obviously, my arm's not really long enough. It'd be best if I had somebody else help me get a two-meter stick, and we can measure the near points and the far points. So what I have is I want to wear eyeglasses that when an object is at my action or is at the ideal far point, how far do I wish to see? Five. No, I, <laughs> I wish to see infinitely far away. I want to look at those distant hills and be able to focus. Now I'm not going to see a lot of detail because they're going to be small angles, but I want to be able to focus. So the ideal far point is infinity. So I want to have an object at infinity and then put a lens that's going to make an image at my actual far point. So I will draw a diagram for this. Here is my eyeball. That's the physics version of an eyeball. And I'm going to put an, a lens in front of this. The lenses that we use for correction are concave meniscus. They're shaped that way to give us the best, the, about the same amount of curvature on both surfaces. For physics problems, unless told otherwise, assume that there's two centimeters between your eyeball and your eyeglasses. That's just a standard we use for physics problems. In reality, if your glasses are a different distance away from your eyeball, you need a slightly different prescription. The distance from your eyeball to, your gla to the glasses is an important part of the prescription of your glasses. And then I'm going to have an object that's placed at my ideal far point. Where's my object? Where's the location? The ideal far point that's infinitely far away. So what's my object distance? Where do I measure my object distance from? From the lens. That's a point where people can make mistakes. So I have distance object equals infinity. Yes, infinity minus two. <laughs> she is correct. I don't... Don't be silly and put infinity minus two, though, because as I say to my son, if I had an infinite amount of money, 
what difference would it make if I had two more dollars? Okay, so there's the object. Then I'm going to have the lens so it makes an image. That's at my actual far point. Well, we tried to measure. Let's say my far point equals 75 centimeters, right? Just to make up a number. If my far point is 75 centimeters, then what is the distance image? Once again, this is something that people can mess up. That's why I'm paying attention to it. Yes. Well, yes and no. Minus that because it's a virtual image. So that sign is kind of important. The, the absolute value is exactly what Jim <laughs> said, what Angelina said. It's the far point minus the two centimeters because the lens is two centimeters away from the eyeball. But you got to make sure you put it in as a negative value. Now we have everything we need to determine the power of the corrective lens. So how do we do this? We just use the thin lens equation the power of the lens is 1 over the focal length is equal to 1 over the distance object plus 1 over the distance image. Using my numbers here, what's 1 over distance object? That's 0. 1 over infinity is just 0 plus 1 over minus the far point actual. Okay, I... No one will ever be able to read my writing. Well, this is really simple now. Turns out the power is just 1 over. I'll put minus up top so I can get rid of that minus on bottom. The far point actual minus two centimeters. So if we take the prescription for Michaela, we can now determine what her actual far point is. We can say that her actual far point, she had, let's take the one that's 0.75. She had minus 0 0.75 diopters equals minus one over far point actual minus, and I'm going to change it to meters, 0 0.02 centimeters. Minus, get rid of those, move things across, far point actual minus 0 0.02 centimeters equals 1 over 0.75 diopters, or 0 0.02 meters, excuse me. I changed it to meters and then I wrote centimeters again. So her far point actual would be 1.35 meters. And as you can tell, 1.35 meters is pretty far away. It's not very bad vision at all. Just so you know, it's pretty good vision. So you can go and you can check what your prescription should be. Now, what if Michaela decided that she wanted to get contact lenses instead of eyeglasses. Would that change your prescription? Yes. Yes. By how much? Well, I have to take off that minus 0 0.02 because the contact lens is right at the cornea, so you don't have that offset. And so I could take this far point actual and just take one over this far point actual is what her prescription would be 
if she was wearing contacts. So if she was wearing contacts, it would be And I went ahead and put in the extra digits. My 0.74 diopters. It's not very different. It would be a bigger difference if her eyesight was worse. <laughs> so that's how you make the calculation for the correction for somebody who is myopic. Any questions about the myopic correction? Because that was, that was basically one of the two options you were going to do for lab. The last one will be the hyperopic or the farsighted. So for a farsighted person, what's the problem with their vision? So the solution... Lens, so an object at ideal near point makes image at actual near point. So NP is the near point. <laughs> Ideally, we say 25 centimeters. What's so ideal about 25 centimeters? It's an average number for people with normal vision. So, I mean, obviously, we'd be happier to see closer. Nothing wrong about seeing closer than 25 centimeters. But that's the average, and that's what we use as the ideal near point. So we're going to say if we have an object at the ideal near point, we want a lens that's going to make an image at the actual near point. So once again, a picture is worth everything. So here's our eyeball. Here is our lens. Notice this is now convex meniscus. Once again, with an offset of two centimeters. And I'm going to put my object at... Twenty-five centimeters. What's the distance object then? Yes. And that's always twenty-three centimeters. So we have the object at twenty-three centimeters, and then we're going to have the image at the actual near point. If you're far sighted, the actual near point is farther away than twenty-five centimeters. So I'm going to make the image near point at the actual near point. So what is the distance image then? We've got all of our numbers here from the eyeball to the ob or to the image is near point actual two centimeters from the eyeball to the lens. So what's just from the lens to the image. Well, it's going to be the like you said before, Angelina, near point actual minus the two centimeters, and then I've got to put the whole thing inside a minus sign because it's on the virtual. So there's my distance image. So for calculational purposes, I'm going to define the NP actual equals, let's say, 50 centimeters. 
So for somebody who's far point is, or near point is twice the ideal. Then we have power is one over focal length is equal to one over distance object plus one over distance image. The object was one over 0 0.23 meters plus the distance image here, one over minus 0 0.50 meters. Come on. Minus 0 0.02 meters. And so I just put that in the old calculator. It's equal to 2.26 diopters. And so that would be the power to correct this person's vision with eyeglasses. How would it be different if this person used contact lenses instead of eyeglasses? I'd actually have to make that correction both, both here and here, right? That would be 0.25 instead of 0.23 and 0.50 instead of 0.48. So that's how you make the corrections. You're just using a lens to make an intermediary image where you can see. That intermediary image is a virtual image. The rays don't actually meet there. What's actually happening with the light rays is the light rays are going like this and then, you know, like this and then like that. Or it depends on which vision you have. But we can talk about the intermediate intermediary image made by the lens that then the eyeball can focus on. So in review, what is the problem for somebody who is myopic. Somebody who is myopic is nearsighted, they can't see far, it means their far point is closer than infinity, which means the eyeball is misshapen, either the eyeball is too long or the cornea has too much curvature. So the laser surgery would flatten the cornea. What about somebody who is hyperopic? They're farsighted, which means they can see far but not near, which means the eyeball is too short or the cornea is too flat. Now, it used to be that the only surgery they would correct for is myopia. Why? Because if you're hyperopic, you need to make the cornea more curved. Well, how do you make it more curved? You can't pile stuff on in the center. You have to shave it away on the edge. But if you make it too thin on the edge, you can you can risk the cornea tearing. And so it used to be they wouldn't do a laser surgery for that because they worried about thinning it too much. Now they think they have things down, so they will do laser surgery. I had a, a roommate who had laser surgery to correct some pretty bad hyperopia. So it's now something that they will do. Then presbyopia. What's the problem with presbyopia? You, you got old person vision, which means that that crystalline lens has hardened and doesn't change shape like it used to. So that you can't accommodate, you can't adjust the focus effectively. And last of all, astigmatism. What's the problem with astigmatism? An asymmetrical cornea. And so the way that's corrected is with a lens that has a, a cylindrical component to it, so it's not the same curvature across two perpendicular axes. All right, like I said, you're done. Everybody gets 100%. I see that Jordan's behind in the grading, so at least we'll have this one graded. <laughs>